Yeah, so hello, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for coming early so, and sorry for the five minutes delay. Yeah, as, as usual, we, we are just like waiting for everyone to be here and seems like, yeah, most people are already here. Uh, we, are, we still have more registrants according to our RSVP, they're around like 100 something, but yeah. Uh, let's just start then. Yeah, so today uh, we will be having an introduction to machine learning workshop. Will, which will be broke by Dennis here. Dennis, uh, and yeah, just a quick intro. Dennis is a senior quant at Alpha Lab Capital. And yeah, he has had, uh, work, he has worked previously at many trading companies, as you can see in the slides. And he has also previously given a talk at uh, our Friday Hacks event. So yeah, today Dennis will be presenting about like the, uh, a series of topics about like machine learning, which cover uh, Scikit-learn, TensorFlow, and then yeah, a lot of other things. And yeah, I believe uh, Dennis will give like a more detailed intro about himself. And yeah, so now I will just like pass on the time to Dennis. Uh, thanks, Steven. Thanks for uh, having us and uh, happy Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, Merry Christmas. Um, yeah, so the workshop uh, is on machine learning and it's sort of an introduction. The kind of a problem, it's a little bit tough to do much within two and a half hours. So I thought of for a while how to do it better. And I sort of came up with this, you know, sort of structure and, uh, you know, I think Stephen and Christopher actually told us a little bit optimistic to cover all of it, but we can try to go to as much as possible. And my kind of intention is to try to kind of hack things together with the audience. And I'm not sure how much interaction I'm gonna get. Um, not sure if there's any like sort of feedback uh, from, from uh, the students, but uh, I guess my idea is more to sort of explain some sort of basics around machine learning. So maybe theory, how to um, view, it, how to view the problems, how to view the techniques and algorithms and sort of in a general structure approach any any problem. And then uh, we sort of go through uh, a bunch of examples from Ascular and honestly their tutorial uh, page is quite amazing. Uh, it's very informative and anyone who wants to, uh, you know, go more in detail absolutely should um, just kind of go through uh, their stuff. But, uh, you know, as, as a machine learning is sort of more of an engineering and it's a kind of a combination of science and art, uh, you end up always kind of referencing uh, this kind of tutorials like SQL or other libraries. And if uh, when, when you actually end up doing the hackathon um, in a couple of days, then maybe it's better to sort of think of a structured way to approach the problem. And then once you're sort of figure out um, the uh, sort of framing and an and algorithm, you can look there and I think it's going to be very helpful. And then you can kind of uh, pick the code and it's not so very complex and sort of uh, apply it uh, to the particular problem. And I think it's kind of what we do um, in, uh, in, in sort of quant trading. Uh, I think it's pretty accurate description. It's sort of a mixture of you know, science and art and normally people who are uh, with sort of computer science background end up uh, at, at high frequency trading companies. And it's more about sort of being able to uh, engineer solutions towards particular problems. Um, including machine learning problems. So um, yeah, I guess uh, I'm trying to sort of tailor it towards what you know um, ends up actually happening rather than doing like a very structured, uh, very uh, theoretical lecture. So um, let's see how it goes. And if, if there is any way to give feedback back, uh, that would be great. Uh, if none, then I guess uh, that's it. So I'll try to share my screen now. Okay. Oh yeah, Dennis. Do you mind if people ask you question during like when you are presenting? Oh yeah, absolutely. The other chat? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Is is the only way to ask questions this chat, or there's anything else? I think the I, students can also leave their question in the chat. But maybe um, if you guys see the questions in the chat, you can also let Dennis know. So. Yeah, I would, I would definitely prefer if they can ask by voice. If they can't, um, then maybe uh, you, Chelsea, or, or one of you guys can help me uh, to flag that there is a question. Yeah. Because, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see that if something comes out while I'm actually uh, uh, kind sure, of yeah. this material. So. 
Sure, we will, we will let you know if we see questions, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, if, if there is a way to do voice, I obviously prefer that. Uh, I'm not sure if it's possible. So, um, okay. So uh, basically, yeah, well, this is a bit of slides and um, a bit of structure and some concepts. And then uh, most of the stuff is going to be on Python notebook. Uh, I think once I sent uh, some stuff to, uh, to the team, I got some feedback that people actually have problems installing Python and getting things to work. So uh, um, we end up using uh, something called Colab uh, on Google. And uh, I don't know if you, uh, did you share the link with, uh, with the audience, Stephen, uh, for Colab or shall I try to send it to the chat? Yes, yeah, you can send it to the chat, yeah. Okay, uh, so I'll just do that. And uh, uh, I guess kind of it's an easy way to uh, interact with the um, kind of dynamic code uh, we can put things together and you guys can experiment and if something fails on your end, then uh, we can kind of uh, walk through that, uh, go, go through it and uh, try to uh, make it more interactive, I guess. So uh, I'm just going to send the link. Uh, okay. And it's something I haven't worked before um, with. So uh, if you guys, uh, if it ever fails, I'll go back to my notebook, which I kind of have here. But um, let's try to stick to the uh, collab and uh, let's see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, then go back to the other one. So um, yeah, I guess uh, starting on the topic, um, there's actually quite a lot um, on machine learning uh, nowadays. It's very easy to find information and it's very uh, sort of available. I guess it's, uh, it's sort of the field exploded a lot in the last uh, few years, specifically maybe like five, 10 years and uh, uh, a lot of tools and actually very kind of easy to use stuff. And I think it's kind of heading towards more and more direction of uh, sort of making it very accessible to a uh, wider audience and making sort of data available. And I think that, you know, a lot of companies are sort of starting starting up in uh, Silicon Valley and uh, even in Singapore, you can see some data companies already. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting um, field. And, you know, obviously if you guys are interested in career and uh, uh, data science, uh, it's, you know, something to uh, uh, kind of watch for and to monitor the field. Uh, but plenty, plenty courses online. Um, a lot of, I think, very high quality um, sort of free material. I don't think it was the case even five years ago. I remember even when I was kind of uh, just looking around, it's, it was much more convoluted and pretty much nothing like 10 years ago. Uh, so I think uh, there's some examples here, which I sort of used to um, um, give a bit of theory and sort of frame, um, frame it better. Um, obviously there's a lot, a lot more. And uh, it's even, even the libraries themselves, uh, which are, uh, I think quite competitive. Actually, I think there's quite a few competing projects in, in terms of open source. Uh, and ask it or anything is probably the most successful one. Uh, they're quite incentivized to give very good tutorials on through their websites. Uh, so if you go to uh, their uh, web pages, then you'll, you'll find all that stuff. And it, we'll, we'll go through um, some of them. And I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's actually not hard to pick up any of the uh, sort of machine learning stuff. And uh, maybe a little bit more of the um, sort of contents and a bit of introduction uh, we're going to start with some sort of general framing of machine learning problems and how is it different from normal programming um, we're not going to do the python environment since uh, we're moving to uh, uh, collab and uh, i sent i sent uh, the link and if anyone has problems uh, accessing it or there are some problems using it uh, uh, do write in the chat uh, it's something i haven't tried before so uh, something new and then we'll kind of talk about uh, a few types of uh, sort of machine learning with uh, a lot of examples and uh, obviously uh, everything in Python. Um, and there's a few things sort of to, to think about when you're um, building uh, models and uh, trying to uh, actually solve a problem with that. And, you know, concepts like uh, model selection and overfitting and sort of uh, bias variance trade-off. Uh, we'll, we'll try to go through that as well. Um, and kind of see how um, that can be illustrated uh, on, on the actual examples. And there's a lot of, like, probably the largest problem of a quant trading, 
um, is actually uh, overfitting. And it's very hard to try to reason about it because you know, your data source is sort of market data and it's, the markets are uh, very dynamic and they change uh, all the time. Uh, so it's kind of hard to, even harder than I guess, let's say in image recognition or uh, general sort of classification problems, uh, uh, harder to reason about sort of uh, the overfitting uh, problem. Uh, so um, we'll go through all of this and obviously cover sort of the basic, um, the basic machine learning algorithms. The sort of general way they structure these tutorials and that's how they structure this libraries um, is that they sort of give you a lot of access to some testing uh, data sets. Uh, and I think that's a very good way to um, kind of apply the algorithms. And general structure is that if you go to like sklearn, for example, they'll give you um, you know, a type of algorithm like classification and uh, they will say, well, this is like a data set. Uh, let's say, you know, whether it's uh, some um, disease classification or, or uh, maybe uh, they, they have uh, obviously the iris classification, things like that. And you kind of see how different algorithms perform um, uh, on the same data set. And I think that's kind of a great way to illustrate that. And we'll go with one of the uh, tutorials as well. Um, so I will sort of assume that people don't know Python here and try to be very um, explicit about what's happening with the code. Uh, I think Python is probably one of the most simple languages to pick up. Um, there's no compilation. It's uh, very straightforward. Uh, it's kind of a combination of uh, a programming language and a scripting language. And I think it's very, very good to start with if you're not very familiar with programming. Um, and I think hopefully the, the examples and, you know, they'll get more and more complex uh, will uh, sort of uh, illustrate how, how to use it. Um, so, yeah, sorry, yes. Hi, Dennis. Sorry to cut yeah. you. I think someone asked whether there's a link to the slides. Uh, there's no link to the slides, but I'll give you a link to the slides. Uh, do that. There's not much useful stuff on the slides, to be honest, but uh, I will share it. So I'll send it to the uh, chat. Um, and, Thank you. <laughs> um, let's go for it. So um, yeah, I guess the general sort of problem with machine learning is, um, you know, trying to give ability to computers to learn uh, without explicitly programming um, the action steps. And uh, if you kind of think about general problems, let's say, you know, playing a game. And here is an example of uh, playing checkers, uh, the checkerboard. And essentially, you can code a computer to uh, for certain rules, but it's very hard to encode uh, the game tree, like the game tree complexities. It's not the highest, obviously, it's not anywhere comparable to um, uh, Go or, or things like that, but uh, it's still very, very hard to reason about it. And it takes some skill to even learn that game uh, as, as, as a player. So it's hard to even encode that uh, in, let's say something simple like if else loops. And then you end up trying to come up with some approximation and sort of maybe objective functions and values saying that, well, this state in the game is better. Maybe we can get there and you kind of do some maybe a simple tree search. And I guess machine learning will be something generalizable uh, to help solve that problem and problems similar to that so that uh, you can achieve an outcome of almost explicitly programming thing, but without doing that. And uh, I guess, you know, sort of the alternative definition here, uh, which you can find online as well, is that it's sort of trying to uh, learn from a certain experience. Uh, and there is, let's say the experience is the uh, data set or training set or test set. And you're trying to perform based on the objective function. In this case, it's B. Uh, in certain tasks, uh, and you're trying to um, sort of improve your performance, which is the objective function over the experience. And uh, I guess it's kind of uh, falls into a general definition of you know kind of gradient descent algorithm, where you're sort of updating your um, parameters and coefficients or the model state uh, based on what you're seeing from the data set, and you sort of keep keep going there and. Uh, 
minimize your uh, sort of training loss. Um, and it's, you know, sort of a more technical, I guess, but um, easier to uh, maybe see in code or uh, see in math definition as well. Um, so there's two general types of machine learning and we'll cover both. Um, I think for us in trading, we'd normally deal with a lot more supervised problems. Uh, it's generally easier to uh, tell what's uh, going on with the data and, uh, and supervised problems are quite common as well and uh, they're extremely, extremely valuable. Um, and I guess the main difference is that you sort of don't know um, the relationship between uh, the input and the output um, um, in, 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 in the case of supervised versus unsupervised learning. And let's say like a classic example of supervised learning is, uh, you know, sort of a regression problem. And you're trying to predict a certain uh, variable. And I think there's an example of sort of uh, uh, house, house prices based on, um, let's say, the income of the area or the inflation index or the GDP or sort of the GDP per capita of the area. So there's a sort of general statement saying that you have an objective function because you know the answer to the problem and you're trying to teach the machine to figure out that answer better and better uh, with time. And uh, that is what we call sort of supervised learning. And, uh, you know, there's two general um, kind of uh, approaches and, and classification uh, in supervised learning, which is uh, regression problems and uh, the other one being uh, classification. Um, and I guess uh, as compared here, you can kind of see that um, uh, with supervised learning, you, and this is a classification problem, uh, you have a two sort of uh, data sets, uh, um, two, two classes rather than two, two data sets. And they're um, very clearly defined. You know the objective, you know the answer. You don't have to teach the machine to figure the answer without knowing the answer, which is the case in supervised learning where you actually don't know the difference between the two sets, but it's sort of explained by the um, actual data set, um, sort of explained by the features. And you train the machine to figure out um, if there are actually classes and how many classes and how to um, define these classes. And uh, a lot of unsupervised learning is actually used for uh, text and sort of uh, natural language processing. Uh, whereas, you know, sort of trying to be very generic about uh, um, sort of looking at text and not making many assumptions about words and their meaning, but trying to figure out rather based on frequency of words or the um, sort of a priori frequency compared to the actual frequency. And you can sort of start clustering um, the, let's say, collection of text or news or uh, books or any sort of data set. And I think that's kind of very, very well used in uh, sort of NLP. Um, and yeah, again, I guess kind of going through the unsupervised learning example, um, I think pretty traditional uh, sort of example is uh, going into uh, sort of a party and trying to write a algorithm which will actually just understand where, you know, where the music is, where, 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 where the voices are and who is talking what. And this is sort of a... Um, non-clustering algorithm because you don't know what's actually labeled at and you're trying to find some similarities within the data stream and then try to uh, figure out what actually is happening there. Um, so I guess with any sort of machine learning, uh, you're, um, uh, you're sort of very prone to uh, overfitting. Um, and overfitting is something to be very concerned uh, at any stage of the problem. And uh, sort of no matter where, where you are in, in sort of learning curve of, uh, of machine learning and general data science, I think overfitting is probably the most important concept to worry about and to take care of it. And uh, again, I think with so far as you like learning machine learning, you'll figure out different ways to address overfitting and how to look at it. But in the very sort of basic form, um, I think everybody should be very worried about it. And, it's the largest uh, single uh, biggest mistake of, I guess, anyone who starts in quad trading, for example, when somebody can join a firm and uh, try to develop a strategy. Uh, I think it's very common that people just find sort of uh, you know, infinite uh, alpha or infinite signal or infinite uh, uh, trading strategy, which just makes a lot of money. 
but it's unfortunately trained on a data set and measured on the same data set and just sort of learns a very particular pattern. Uh, and I think it's a kind of a classic uh, example of uh, kind of a mistake in, uh, in quant trading career. Uh, and obviously, even if you're sort of progress further in that, the overfeeding is always going to be sort of a problem. And there's a lot of trade-offs to make in sort of model design and experiment design and uh, uh, the things you're uh, consider while even creating features or uh, putting features together. So uh, I guess the example here is kind of a, a regression problem where you know the um, output and uh, you know the input, the input is size and there's a price. Um, let's say it's uh, the same pricing model for housing market. And uh, it's not sort of like a straight line. Um, and you can start feeding different uh, polynomials here. And the three examples with um, sort of single degree of freedom, uh, two degrees of freedom, and four degrees of freedom. Um, and uh, I guess in general, you sort of measure the quality of the fit, which is um, the divergence of uh, the uh, pre predicted uh, point, which is price, from the actual price. And we'll go through um, that concept a bit more in detail later, but uh, I think for now, just think of it as uh, something where you're trying to find the closest fit for that blue line here uh, to go into the uh, sort of uh, red uh, data set, uh, red dot here. And with a single uh, sort of uh, degree of freedom, it's probably the least, uh, I guess, uh, prone to overfitting model because there's no many parameters. And that's generally the case where yeah, fewer parameters means uh, sort of very, very uh, lower chance of overfitting. And uh, it sort of goes into uh, neural networks specifically because neural networks have uh, very, very high uh, dimensionality. And when people sort of design them, I think, again, the largest concern and, and consideration is how to make sure that that dimensionality doesn't start picking up the uh, noise in the data. And uh, kind of here, um, you sort of see that, uh, you know, obviously the single degree of freedom is fit not so well, but it's still reasonable prediction. You see that the size obviously increases uh, the price. And this is kind of a model which looks like uh, maybe a uh, second degree polynomial or um, it may be probably like more like a log. Um, actually, um, there's no example of a log, but it seems like more like a log uh, function type. Uh, you know, it probably gives you like a right sort of trade-off uh, if, if you kind of feel just that that line is is looking better compared to the first one. And then there's a crazy sort of model with a lot of overfitting on the right side with too many parameters. And uh, that's what you're trying to avoid, just getting this sort of very um, elaborate, uh, complex blue line, which fits every point perfectly. But unfortunately, it has no prediction power because at some point it even starts going down uh, with, with the size and it's sort of very uh, useless model in that sense. So I think even the first model would be highly, highly superior to it. Uh, and that's sort of the problem you're trying to avoid in any sort of machine learning uh, environment. And uh, I think a lot of sort of techniques and considerations and uh, framing and even, even the code inside Python will sort of deal with that type of uh, uh, concept. And uh, there are a few ways to sort of deal with it. And uh, I think there are two sort of uh, um, main ones, I guess. One is just feature reduction. And uh, uh, here we sort of um, added uh, uh, more features like the square of the size or the cube of the size or um, even a high degree of polynomial. Um, and obviously increasing the number of features, you're more likely to overfit. And that's a general, general property of pretty much any model. Um, there's probably some exceptions, but I think it's true uh, in most, most cases. And uh, obviously, when you want to prevent overfitting, you want to reduce the size uh, of the feature set. And you end up just removing features. You can manually select them. You can sort of look at their significance. And, uh, or you can use some uh, variable selection algorithm or even a model selection algorithm um, and kind of try to compare models based on the, uh, some, some defined utility function, uh, which is, again, kind of the general approach in uh, machine learning as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then the other approach is um, kind of using more, I guess, mathematical way of thinking about it, where you're sort of trying to um, penalize the model for having too many parameters. And uh, there's a way to express that mathematically, 
where you sort of add uh, a uh, cost component to the utility function, which ends up uh, sort of skewing your uh, coefficients or your model or your parameters towards having fewer or lower value for like a lot of features. Um, so uh, I guess we'll, we'll kind of talk about both and uh, uh, I wasn't planning to go through sort of uh, variable selection, um, but we can try to look a little bit about uh, intake as well, especially in the case of like linear models. And uh, again, there are plenty of uh, sort of sci, um, sci kit learn uh, tutorials which sort of deal with it. And um, I'll actually show you that page I keep talking about um, on the uh, sci kit learn. And uh, that's sort of how it looks like. Uh, uh, if you actually go through all of them, I think you probably end up with a very uh, decent amount of machine learning uh, already. Uh, and I definitely recommend everybody sort of uh, going through it and we'll go through some of that and maybe some other ones as well. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's probably one of the best resources online to try to pick it up. So uh, definitely, definitely uh, look at it. Um, so going back to sort of uh, overfitting, I guess at some point um, you kind of end up thinking about, well, how do you benchmark this overfitting? Because let's say you have an A model and you have B model and they look kind of similar. You have to start expressing it more uh, mathematically. And on that example before we had a different degree of polynomial and obviously one is better than the other. And it's clear because you know, the chart kind of makes it clear, but often it won't be. And you'd have to start benchmarking models and uh, there's a few techniques in that. And normally what you end up doing is um, splitting the set into two parts, into training set and a test set. And they normally have no overlap. And uh, again, going back to sort of trading, let's say you're trying to train a model for a year um, and you have a year of data, you can say, I'm gonna look at uh, nine months of data for training and then I'm going to add the last three months of data for uh, testing. And that sort of test you have at the end is going to be the uh, kind of benchmark of that model. Uh, there is kind of a common problem with this approach as well, which I think people tend to forget, is that uh, you cannot measure uh, models based on the test set multiple times. Uh, and you probably encounter that in, in some tutorials and, and, and some advice, but uh, I think once, uh, you know, so the general idea is once you've chosen the uh, test set, you have to stick with it and you can only use it once. You cannot keep selecting and tweaking models based on the test, test set because it becomes like sort of a second training set. So once you sort of measured your algorithms once, um, that's kind of the end of the experiment and you can't continue sort of tweaking that. And that's why you have to be very cautious about uh, using the test set to tweak the parameters. Uh, and that's sort of where this concept of cross validation comes in, um, where you're sort of trying to uh, kind of explain um, certain parameters or choose better parameters rather uh, inside the model with splitting the, the, the tests uh, in different folds. And uh, I guess the concept here is that uh, you're consistently uh, breaking the uh, data set uh, into uh, different um, potential combinations of, let's say you can split it into five, uh, five splits, and then you can create uh, five folds out of it, uh, which you're uh, sort of um, training the, the problem on. And then you can keep running that experiment many times and then average over that to achieve a high uh, sort of significant result. And again, we'll go through all of that in the code, but just for now, I think that cross-validation is something which allows you to break the uh, data set uh, into groups and then um, combine the groups in some kind of combinatorial way um, to allow yourself uh, more, um, I guess, larger size of the experiment, which eventually means more significant. There's obviously some sort of a trade-off, um, you know, kind of trying to, uh, let's say you have a thousand points and create, creating hundred data sets of 10 points and trying to combine them in different permutations. Uh, doesn't actually improve much. And there's the general curve of, uh, uh, how the uh, cross validation size uh, or the rather default size and the uh, split size uh, affect it. And uh, we can, I think there's some tutorial on SQLR and again, we can kind of go through it quickly. Uh, but essentially you kind of want to be reasonable about, I think, you know, kind of a number of five and three and maybe seven is uh, what people end up choosing for uh, cross validation. And then in some cases you might want to go over this numbers, but uh, 
uh, essentially kind of uh, allowing to run this uh, training set and uh, um, sort of optimization set uh, on different data sets, which are, again, come from the same source, but split a little bit differently. And it allows you to uh, get a range, potential range of how the model will perform outside, um, outside the data you're training it on. And uh, uh, kind of going back to this again, you end up kind of having actually uh, three uh, splits potentially, and you have a training set um, which will actually train the model. And let's say the model is uh, the that, that linear regression line which is uh, looked at here. Um, and then there is a parameter, and the parameter of the model is the number of um, uh, the degree of polynomial. And if it's um, you know let's say you can fix it being from zero or being constant to uh, five or four. And that parameter can vary. And what actually cross-validation helps you for is to choose this optimal parameter. Uh, so you get sort of split into three sets. First, actually, the one you use for training the models uh, or the submodels, then um, cross-validation set, which you use to train the parameter. Uh, and normally people call this type of parameter the hyperparameter, um, and uh, sort of end up uh, coming up with the optimal one. And then you can, once you come up with an optimal one, which already Unfortunately, we'll have some uh, cross validation set bias because you're chosen the max of it. And by natural sort of randomness, going through this test many times, you pick up potentially a wrong answer, uh, which implies some bias. Uh, you end up in a test set, which is very pure. And in this case, like once you're actually measured there and don't make any selection based on this, this is going to be sort of representative of how the model performs. And that's sort of the general idea between different data splits and how you conduct uh, experiments. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll see that in, in the examples. And generally, again, people kind of use, in, in simple models, you only need two, which is training and test. In more complex thing, you start considering three. Uh, one is for training, the other one is for, for parameter, hyper parameter selection, and then actually for testing. And then there are kind of more uh, statistically interesting algorithms like the uh, K-fold kind of cross-validation. Uh, um, I guess uh, kind of more mathematically speaking about uh, this, uh, uh, sort of overfitting concept. Um, there is this, it, it's a pretty well known concept in machine learning. It's called sort of bias versus variance trade off. Um, and uh, it kind of describes uh, the um, sort of this overfitting property um, with uh, some test sets as well. And it allows you to understand where there's an optimal point of complexity of the model which you want to achieve. And again, here kind of with the uh, uh, sort of general quadratic error function of uh, saying that you basically measure the sum of squares uh, of deviation of your actual uh, variable to the predicted variable. Um, that can be broken down into a few sort of components here. And uh, one is the actual sort of um, uh, bias uh, of, of, of how, how badly it predicts uh, that, that function. Um, then you sort of end up with um, sort of variance, uh, which is kind of, uh, I guess, the uh, way of looking into it is sort of uh, um, having maybe way too much complexity and allowing for a lot of randomness outside the points you measure, uh, which is sort of what it's called variance. Um, and then there is sort of a uh, the third remainder component, which is uh, we don't really care for because uh, again in this concept it doesn't really matter. Um, and then the way to look at it is you kind of have this sort of smile curve, where um, if you look at the uh, bias uh, sort of curve line, uh, it ends up just always uh, reducing. So you kind of uh, starts with very very high bias, meaning that the model is not complex. And again, in the case of uh, uh, this straight line, uh, there's some bias, it's not too bad, but if you actually use a constant, it might just take the average value here, uh, and the bias is going to be pretty high. Um, and then, uh, uh, obviously, with increasing your complexity, you can fit, you know, well, however, however, points, however number of points you have uh, quite perfectly, uh, in which case you're sort of, you know, obviously getting error closer and closer to zero, but the actual model power or explanatory power or the value of the model doesn't really improve because uh, outside that test set, uh, you still can be doing very poorly. And again, on that example with a degree of four, uh, the, the, the line just ends up being quite quite crazy. Um, so you kind of think about this two um, uh, 
uh, two errors, I guess, and there's a training error, uh, which is what we sort of uh, measure uh, again in, in this sort of utility function. And then you kind of end up with the cross validation error. And you can, if you sum them together, you get this sort of uh, total error curve, um, which is sort of explaining where is actually the uh, optimal point for the model complexity. And I guess in the example here, you end up with, let's say the de degree of polynomial equal to two, and it feels kind of right, but again, I think quadratic feels, you know, kind of weird for the uh, uh, price and size relationship, but uh, uh, no matter what, fit the data well. Um, and uh, I guess you kind of end up um, trying to figure out that optimal point of high parameter based on uh, cross validation. And again, many examples, and we'll go through uh, I think one or two, uh, but just keep in mind that there's this sort of uh, uh, bias um, variance trade off, and meaning that you know the higher the complexity, the more variance you'll have. Uh, and the lower the complexity, the more bias you have. Um, so this is kind of the general sense of, I guess, machine learning. Uh, there's a bit more theory here. And uh, at this point, we'll go more into actual algorithms. And uh, I guess the, um, the, the, the workshop with Python code. And if there are any questions about, uh, let's say, you know, the math or the concepts or the terminology, maybe now it's kind of a good good time to stop and uh, ask students to, I don't know, a voice or, uh, or chat them. I'll give it a minute um, and pause here. And if there are questions, then uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat. But otherwise, we'll continue in a minute. I hope that there are some questions actually, and maybe they'll come out more on the examples. Uh, I think it's, it's my fourth time doing a lecture tutorial workshop on Zoom. And I think the interactiveness is normally lost, unfortunately, and uh, you kind of rarely get a lot of questions. Uh, but again, I do encourage if anyone has any questions, it's, uh, it's just valuable for actually trying to go through some potential misunderstandings or um, kind of thinking or just to clarify things. Okay, well then we'll continue. Uh, there's no questions. Um, so a little bit about Python um, and sort of Python is a object oriented interpreter based uh, programming language. Um, it's probably one of the easiest languages to learn um, and it's kind of reasonably hard to master and it's even harder to maintain as a, as a choice for um, sort of programming tool. But, you know, for things like um, Hackathon, it's probably one of the best tools uh, there has ever been, uh, especially just given the uh, kind of ubiquitousness of it and everybody sort of knows it and you pretty much can find uh, any machine learning algorithm uh, and I think there's sort of a, uh, I think there's maybe 10 years ago, there was a um, R, which is kind of still exists and it's re reasonably common, but not so common anymore. And I think you can kind of see that Python end up uh, sort of overtaking it, uh, uh, overtaking it at some point. Yeah, I think this is kind of the point I'm talking about. Um, and yeah, I remember like, around 2010, the R actually was kind of more, um, popular and uh, there was a lot more packages, but I think recently given the sort of development of Python, uh, we'll end up with a lot more um, there and it's just a lot easier to use and integrate with other languages or, and it's actually a fully fledged sort of language which you can use uh, in a lot of systems, uh, including trading systems. Uh, so definitely um, the leader, I guess now uh, and it's pretty simple as well. Uh, it's sort of a combination of a, a um, 
scripting and actually fully fledged language. There are some problems with it and there's some limitations which are actually kind of hard to overcome. Uh, but for data science, people normally find ways and they end up writing maybe some C inside of it and uh, kind of making it faster at some points or going out of the uh, process space uh, to, uh, uh, sorry guys, I have some call. Apologies for the interruption. Um, so uh, Python um, sort of ends up being kind of useful, but very limited. And the most of the limits in this actually, for example, in particularly our case, uh, comes from a single threadedness. So Python uh, is only single threaded and it's sort of a part of the design of the interpreter where you have this uh, sort of GIL, um, which is the global interpreter, uh, interoperability lock and uh, that basically locks the thread and only one line of um, sort of code code structure can be executed at the same time. There are sort of threads, but they're more of an abstraction thinking and code design techniques and this, you know, uh, sort of async type uh, um, frameworks uh, where it allows you to think about problem uh, in a uh, sort of um, threading way without actually explicitly using threads. Uh, but I think generally people try to go out of the uh, process space uh, for um, for solving that sort of uh, geo problem. And uh, here, um, again, you know, it's a very sort of uh, voluminous and uh, there's a lot of features and it's pretty, pretty useful uh, language with a lot of um, components like every other language has. Um, everything's sort of passed by uh, uh, value and uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward to use. Um, again, it's very popular and it's probably number one in uh, sort of machine learning uh, applications. And I think here is this uh, where we can start with um, some data exploration and using some uh, charts. So I'll start switching to the, um, um, the collab uh, and we can kind of go through some um, basic Python syntax first and then kind of go more into the uh, algorithms and the uh, data and how to even look at the data. Um, so I think that's working. So generally, you know, this is kind of a um, notebook type environment and generally you can run that uh, inside your computer, which looks more like this. Um, it's a Jupyter notebook and that will have um, the sort of cells where you write Python and execute them. All the code will execute there. It ends up kind of showing you the output. So it's a very easy and good interactive way to examine data sets and try um, algorithms. So uh, for anyone who hasn't seen that before, uh, it's definitely uh, worth um, doing. And uh, I think this is kind of a Google hosted version of that. Uh, so we'll try to use that as much as we can. Uh, but if we can't, we'll switch back to the local version. Um, and kind of start maybe with um, the simple sort of Python uh, syntax. Uh, um, sorry, Dennis, do you yeah. mind like uh, zooming in oh, yeah, uh, to the window. Yeah, I think it's kind of difficult to see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> that. Uh, I'm not sure if there is like a way to uh, increase that without zooming, but I guess I'll just keep the zoom. Um, so you kind of end up um, with reasonably simple syntax and everything is executed as it's run because it's, uh, it's an interpretable language. It's not a compiled language. Um, so there's no compiler. Uh, you just pretty much execute and the all the uh, sort of stack trace and um, the uh, tree of the execution stays where, where it kind of leaves it. So, so long as you execute this sequentially, they end up sort of running sequentially. Um, the syntax is pretty simple. Uh, I guess this is sort of an example of importing a library and it's a system library, uh, which allows you to get access to some um, sort of version field, let's say here for actual Python. And we can see this is uh, 3.69. Um, this is how you sort of import a uh, library here. And um, this is SciPy, uh, this is sklearn, um, and you're pretty much, yeah, it's kind of the same code here. So, um, and just to sort of uh, practice with this, you can do something like that. Um, and then we just run that um, cell whenever you press to run, um, append the output here. Uh, <coughs> So maybe we can go through sort of a data exploration stage, which is uh, uh, kind of uh, probably a number one stage in sort of any machine learning um, real world problem. Uh, and again, you kind of end up doing the same for trading. 
um, as an example from sort of real world, you first kind of look at the market data and you try to understand um, sort of at least what market you're trading, what, what sort of the magnitude of moves and how it looks like across time and how does the you know, internal parameters of the book, for example, change. Uh, so here we have, uh, I think it's a pretty common uh, sort of iris uh, data set. Uh, and this is sort of the way to import it. Uh, maybe we can just get some quick uh, description on this uh, uh, data set um, just to kind of understand what actually uh, we're dealing with it's very very common uh, and it's yeah it's a UCI machine learning repository data set which essentially contains uh, I think different uh, types of um, this plant and uh, they have different length width of uh, sepal and petal I guess different parts of the flower um, and then just have different classes so um, essentially this is what we're dealing with and um, for example, this is just a bunch of libraries we import and uh, you sort of specify which function you want to import if you want to import one function or you can import the full um, library in uh, that kind of way. And here, um, the first step is sort of to download, download this uh, data set. And in Python, it's actually very easy to do. Um, basically, this is just a um, HTTP link which will lead to the uh, CSV file, which looks like this. Um, with all this data set and uh, in Python you can easily uh, read the CSV from uh, the internet. Uh, oh nice, it actually shows the, the code of the CSV function and all the possible inputs. Um, so this is kind of like I guess a descriptor and it's a nice um, part of this web interface. It allows you to see which parameters can you specify to this particular function um, and it's a read CSV function. Uh, so you could sort of start with uh, Inputting the file file path or the link in this case, and uh, specifying other parameters. And here we just uh, specify the uh, column names because I think the uh, actual uh, again the actual CSV file doesn't have that. So in, in this case, uh, we kind of add the column names, um, and uh, you end up with the um, object here, which I think is going to be a data frame. Uh, and data frame is uh, a, uh, yes, it's a pandas object and pandas is sort of the main data uh, dealing kind of library in, uh, in Python. It allows you to operate uh, mostly with data frame and data series. Um, and it's very valuable for structuring your uh, input and output and kind of communicating between different uh, Python um, parts and different Python libraries. It's pretty well used. It's probably, uh, um, I guess, the second most core um, library here after NumPy. And NumPy is sort of a numerical Python library with uh, a lot of sort of linear algebra and uh, sort of array and uh, mathematical um, representations of uh, things. Uh, it's quite interesting, actually. This thing gives a lot of information uh, once you click on it. Um, I didn't know that. So. Um, so this is a data frame which we just read and uh, we can kind of analyze it quickly and just have a look at it and you can just print it and this means you just print the first 20 rows uh, of the data set and uh, this is what it looks like and again it looks exactly like the csv we just looked at and um, this is sort of the data um, again kind of hard to reason about numerical data and seeing but at least it looks reasonable and there are sort of values everywhere there's no missing data and the classes kind of uh, make sense and uh, uh, we'll continue with this. So I'll just um, start using my um, sort of code on the side and I'll just sort of go through it. And I guess I'll show you some functions how to examine this data stats. So I think one um, uh, valuable um, thing is to use the describe uh, function. Uh, let's try adding, okay. It's playing with some um, PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow here. So, um, the describe just kind of gives you the um, very sort of basic information about the data. So it gives you all the quartiles. Um, it gives you the mean max and deviation and mean uh, for all of them. So that kind of gives you a better sense of what actually you're dealing with. Are there any outliers? Are, are there sort of any um, problems with the data? Are there missing values? What sort of the scale you're talking about and uh, sort of what sort of things actually we should look at. And, you know, everything here sort of looks reasonable, again, sort of valuable to look. I think the next question sort of problem once you're trying to classify it is, uh, 
um, I guess, how many classes are there? And uh, looking at here, they said there were three. Um, and we can check that here by, um, you can group the data set uh, by the class field, uh, which is this field, and it will just give you the um, breakdown and the number of classes. So every class has 50 points there. So here you kind of see that um, they're kind of equally distributed and uh, you can um, use it for some machine learning. It's not that much data, but it's okay to start and kind of uh, look at some things. Uh, a few more useful functions, uh, you can sort of use the plot function uh, to uh, look at this uh, sort of uh, box plot, uh, which allows you to, again, it sort of gives you like a confidence interval, like a range and quartiles, but everything's sort of plotted. Uh, and uh, there are four features here and so the, the, uh, the mean and the quartiles and which is the range of it. Uh, and I guess this is sort of uh, maybe some kind of outliers that tries to flag them. Uh, so far it falls like kind of far outside you know, certain criteria, I guess. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess another useful one would be histogram. So you can look at the histogram of this data. Um, you can quickly load it, just pretty simple um, uh, plotting. You know, plot histogram, and this is just to show the um, uh, the actual charts. I think it just wouldn't show it if you don't use this. If you try this, um, it sort of ends up. I think it's sort of pi oh, actually, it does work, but it shows a bunch of other things. Um, I guess this is just takes the last output of the this plot and just shows it rather than actually printing the whole thing. Uh, so it's kind of a nice utility. Uh, you might not have to do it, but if you run on the command line, you might have to use this. Um, so yeah, this just kind of shows the distribution, how it looks like, and does it look like more like a normal distribution? It's kind of towards more like uniform and there's something kind of different and it's kind of valuable to know the things. And I guess for now, we'll just go through a bunch of charts like this and try to reason about it. And then we'll um, go back to SQLearn and try to figure out which algorithm we should apply to this data set and see how we can classify the data based on the, uh, on the inputs. Uh, so this is kind of a scatter plot, which is shows, I guess, uh, more or less a correlation between uh, certain parameters. And you can see some of them are pretty much um, very, very highly correlated. Some are close to one and some of them are sort of scattered. And I guess the uh, width uh, and length here um, quite, uh, I guess, just the size of the petal, kind of uh, very high correlation. It has the histogram in the middle as well. and. It's something just to explore the data before actually doing much with it. Um, I think this is kind of the basic structure of, let's say, data exploration. And maybe we can kind of uh, look at uh, some um, tutorial how to actually do it. And that's, you know, sort of the approach you would take if you don't know much of machine learning, you're sort of uh, trying to uh, just figure out what algorithm you can apply to the data set. And we'll go back to the SQLearn. And uh, in this case, um, you know, this is the actual image case of that uh, thing, similar data set over the images. And uh, I guess we can use something maybe here. Yeah, I think this is uh, kind of an example with the data set. You can sort of play around and uh, I'll explain this code as well. So. Here, yeah, you can actually, this data set is contained inside SQLearn as well. And we downloaded it um, with a read CSV function. And uh, there are actually plenty of data sets in SQLearn, as I said earlier. And I sort of tried to get the list of them. Uh, let me just copy paste it here. Uh, might be valuable. Um, yeah, the, so the list here and the, the provide, I guess, the nine data sets. Uh, different house prices and sort of the things you can play around with. And I think it's very kind of useful just to explore different algorithms and data sets. And I think it's a good way to approach, uh, you know, learning machine, uh, sort of machine learning and trying to get a hang of it. So uh, definitely play around with them and sort of maybe choose one and try to apply all these sort of um, algorithms there and compare them. Uh, and again, I don't think we would have time to do that, but it's more maybe like a five or 10 hour commitment. But it's quite interesting, and I think it's a good way to study uh, on sort of your own. Uh, but I think now we're on this uh, Iris data set, and uh, let's sort of look at what example they give and how they work with it. And uh, again, I think it's pretty pretty valuable. So, so here it's kind of the same chart. Um, they take uh, some parameters uh, and 
and uh, the sort of plotted and show all the classes based on the colors, you kind of can see that, uh, you know, so very small length kind of means uh, something, but if it's like kind of wide, it's a, a different type of flower and you can kind of see, you know, there, there's meaning in these features. And again, you don't have to look at this to understand that. You can just sort of run the algorithm and get some uh, more numerical output, but it's nice to look at these charts and sort of explore about it. And um, since these 2D plots are kind of only valuable within the uh, sort of again, 2D environment, it, it's hard to do multi-dimensional plots. Uh, I think here we had like four, uh, four um, variables. And, and I think they end up um, using, uh, let's see, what did I should do that. Yeah, they're using PCA here. So this example is just for um, using the principal component analysis where they try to, um, it's another technique for uh, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, fighting overfitting and trying to uh, reduce the number of features you're supplying. So they end up with three features rather than four. And uh, eigenvector is sort of a concept in math where uh, you look at the sort of linear operator and you try to extract the basis of it and sort of eigenvectors will represent the basis of it. And I guess the way to think about it, it's kind of the most significant uh, linear combination of these features, um, which you can come up with and significant in the sense of sort of variance explanation. Um, that's how sort of the linear algebra fits into the, um, uh, I guess, statistics. Um, and maybe a lot of people are not familiar with it. Maybe it's very trivial, it's kind of hard to gauge. But uh, I guess think of it more as like, well, if you have 100 features, how do you build a model with three? Uh, so you don't end up coming up with 100 coefficients, which are um, any sort of random numbers you can pick together and just fit into the data set. So you're only choosing three coefficients here instead of four. And that's a way to um, sort of uh, deal with this dimensionality reduction. And um, I guess, yeah, it's pretty straightforward code here. I think they just kind of do the PCA, um, not super valuable for us but um, kind of good to know, I guess. Uh, and uh, we can try to use some, um, we don't have the example of the virus, we can just look at the classification available in SQLearn and there will be a page um, with this classifiers and we can kind of build an algorithm based on this. So this is like one of these examples I was talking about before where they uh, look at sort of classifiers and uh, they, um, come up with a way to compare them uh, based on the uh, sort of single data set. So the data set is kind of the same in all of them and it's probably split into three. Um, and then uh, they sort of come up with um, this sort of grid which explains you how they would look like and what the difference is. And again, we don't have to, we don't have time to go through uh, another uh, 10 algorithms here. They're all pretty, um, some of them are quite complex and you know, like the support vector machine uh, you probably can do a few hours uh, just talking about the math behind it and maybe some more simpler, at least conceptually, uh, but still probably quite complex in implementation algorithms like the uh, K uh, near near neighbors uh, classifiers. But we'll talk about more about classifiers, uh, I guess for now, just sort of seeing that, uh, you know, this is how the uh, data set kind of looks like. Uh, it's good enough and we'll go back to uh, classification sort of um, problem and the algorithms there as uh, a the small sort of section of that. But for now, if you were to be at this point where you kind of look at the data, let's say three classes, there's some meaning in these features, they're kind of correlated. The next thing would be to probably take one of these uh, classifiers and apply it to this problem. Uh, and again, if we have time at the end, we can do that. Uh, it wasn't necessarily my plan, um, but We'll, we'll go through some of these classifiers in this example in particular actually later. Um, so going back to, um, I guess, kind of uh, Python um, and machine learning, let's kind of focus on maybe uh, for now linear regression um, and then we'll go back to uh, classifying. So the, uh, how do we present? Um, so the linear regression is kind of a simple concept where you're trying to pretty much draw a line which tries to explain um, you know, y with x. And uh, it's pretty, probably the most trivial, but also very, very well used and uh, powerful technique to um, use for data. And there's a lot of flavors in that. And it's actually, it gets quite complex. I'm pretty sure people are 
writing uh, thesis and doing a lot of research still and uh, a lot of fields of sort of um, linear optimization and uh, sort of machine learning applied and linear regression. There's quite a, quite a lot actually happening in uh, I think reinforcement learning specifically applied to linear models and uh, how the policy iteration sort of works there. Uh, it's quite, quite interesting field, but uh, uh, again, it's very kind of easy to understand and uh, we'll, we'll go through uh, an example uh, as well. And I guess mathematically speaking, you have a vector you're trying to explain. So this is, I guess, a uh, multidimensional um, notation and you have a matrix of um, X um, and here once means it's um, just a constant without actually a feature. Um, you're sort of trying to fit into this line where you try to explain multidimensional Y with a multidimensional X. Um, and there's different, obviously a few points there. Um, this is what the rows for. Um, and obviously there's gonna be some noise. So it's not perfectly fitting. And, you know, sort of again, looking back at the data uh, with the example we just went through, you kind of, uh, even if you try to sort of build a simple like single, um, single variable in your regression model between these uh, features, right? Let's say trying to predict the, um, um, let's say petal length with petal width. And it looks pretty, pretty highly um, kind of correlated. And uh, it's kind of an easy, um, you know, thing to say that it's probably gonna be a pretty good model for it. And there's some things which look a bit different and uh, generally, you know, linear regression is not gonna work. Uh, but this is a good way to start, and uh, then you might have to do some transformations and uh, a bunch of other things, which uh, we're not going to cover in this workshop. But uh, again, um, there's a lot of them are covered in tutorials and uh, on SKLR, so do um, do go there and uh, do check it out. So um, I guess maybe we'll talk about visualization first before going to the example. And here it's a bit more of a sort of mathematical concept. And we talked about it before. And uh, again, people with, uh, you know, no statistics or sort of mathematical background uh, or physics, I guess, it's gonna be kind of hard to understand that maybe, but essentially what you end up doing is you're introducing like another penalty term in the objective function. And what ends up happening is essentially you sort of push yourself um, down the sort of uh, variance bias curve um, without actually throwing out variables or changing the parameter. And regularization becomes a hyperparameter in that sense. And you end up first maybe cross-validating the um, um, regularization term and the coefficient for it, and then actually building the model based on the optimal regularization for that type of data. And uh, generally there are two types of uh, regularization for linear regression, and I'm sure there are a lot more complex ones. Uh, but I guess traditionally you'll find that there's the L1 and L2, uh, and it just means that it's a you know sort of a quadratic and linear term. Uh, you can see here, this is what it ends up. And essentially the way to think about it is like, you sort of have a penalty, which is just the misfit, right? And you have a line here and perfectly fits all the red dots. And there's many lines you can like draw there. They don't have to be straight lines. Um, and here it's not again, necessarily a linear regression, it could be just a V function. Um, and there are many ways to draw these lines. Um, it might end up being like the blue line if you don't do the regularization. And the way to sort of make it simpler or to um, reduce the weight of coefficients or to reduce the number of features depending on the L1 and L2, again, it's not to be covered here, but it sort of ends up simplifying your model in a mathematical sense. And that's how you know you kind of think about it. And uh, yeah, it's a kind of a, uh, ends up a better outcome essentially. You kind of uh, more, uh, Sort of explanation power, and you can cross validate that particular regularization on, uh, on, on the data set you're kind of working with. Um, so let's kind of go through maybe a linear regression and a, uh, a uh, regularization as well. Uh, SKLRN deals with them, uh, with both of them pretty, pretty well. So uh, um, I guess so let's see which data set I had prepared. Um, Right, so we can look at the, the there's a um, uh, diabetes data set. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I'll remove this um, TensorFlow example. So I don't need it anymore. And uh, let's look at the air regression here. So the comment in Python is just a uh, hash symbol. 
So um, this is first just to import. Uh, oh, this is something else. This is to import um, the libraries, and uh, we just care about data sets and uh, potentially um, some uh, metrics and functions here. Uh, and we're curious about building linear models, so we import the linear model here. Uh, the I think if you no, yeah you can do the uh, um, uh, type type hinting uh, I guess uh, autocomplete here and it will tell you everything available in that um, package which is sklearn uh, without the submodule and you can see sort of the range of things they offer there and again you can just go to their website and uh, go through it as well uh, and it's another way to explore. Um, in a more like kind of code code way, uh, but here we're dealing with linear models, so we're only interested in this. Um, so now let's just load the data set and kind of let's read about it. Um, uh, essentially, once you use the SQLR and loading, it, I think it looks a bit different because it ended up like with a lot of other fields and uh, they kind of give you a lot of information about it. Um, but uh, let's have a look what it actually means uh, SQLR and uh, diabetes data set. Um, so this is kind of the function to load it and uh, see if we can find much information in it. Um, it doesn't seem to be that easy, uh, but I'm guessing it sort of ends up being just a uh, uh, there's 10 features here, uh, there's 442 points. Um, there's a range and uh, I guess, uh, why don't we try to explore it then if there's no easy uh, description. Um, so I guess um, we, yeah, let's, let's go with the linear model first and then um, we'll kind of um, see what actually comes up with it. And, uh, oh yeah, here we go. There is actually a description here. So. Uh, again, this is just a dictionary. You can uh, access the uh, uh, dictionary pretty uh, easily. So um, you can get that line from there and it probably has all the columns uh, inside. Um, there was some link as well. So it might actually have um, uh, more information on that link as well. But so it's 10 baseline variables. That's age, size, body, mass index, average blood pressure, six uh, measurements, uh, 442 patients. And I guess uh, they're trying to predict whether uh, it's uh, the outcome is probably whether it's uh, diabetic or not diabetic person. Um, so uh, let's kind of look at it and let's also look at the um, what actually is trying to be predicted here. Um, I guess you can do the blood pressure based on the other parameters as well. So you can kind of play around and choose. Uh, um, but let's see what actually ends up happening here. So you can sort of uh, see, you end up splitting the data set first, right? And we have 442 points here. Um, that would be just the actual features. Um, the way to get that in Python is to, um, so this data set here is represented as um, an umpire array, which is not a data frame actually. And this is the way to convert that. Um, it's kind of hard to go through it, okay. I haven't seen that before. Normally they will sort of um, fold it for you. So um, yeah, you kind of uh, basically do this manipulation. It's a bit kind of hard to understand at first, but uh, uh, it's kind of a NumPy uh, way to express um, this data. And if you just look at the data, um, it's just probably a bunch of NumPy things. Uh, Um, so this is to extract the features. Um, then we'll split it into two groups. Um, basically everything until um, this is to extract the first um, 412, uh, I guess, uh, points. And this is the last point. So the test sample ends up being just the last 30 points. And we're going to train on the first um, 412 or whatever points number was there. Then we sort of uh, initialize the um, linear regression model, um, and to fit it, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, so this is a linear model package. Um, it has quite a few um, sort of flavors of linear regression, and we can kind of play around with them at some point. But again, uh, SQLearn will have them, and you can look at them. It's very extensive, and again, 
quite quite a lot of time to go through it, but just keep in mind that there's many, many of them here. Um, so once you initialize the object, um, you can uh, sort of train that model on the um, train data set we have. Um, and again, this is the, I'm kind of curious what's the uh, train uh, data set length here. I don't remember. If you don't remember the total length of the uh, uh, of X, yes, yeah, so it's 112 as we um, calculated. And uh, you also here we're missing Y uh, train data set. So it's the same thing. And uh, we just look at the target function here. So we can just add here. We just look, take the first target and the last, uh, the, the first, um, except for the last 30 and the last 30. Um, so you end up kind of fitting this model. And then we can look at um, what the model looks like. Um, uh, normally the way to access it would be coefficients. And there's a uh, single coefficient because we chose a single um, single variable here. Um, I guess, uh, let's see which variable was that. Uh, it's kind of inconvenient to scroll through. Um, so it shows the second variable and that was a, uh, That was the age. So um, it's kind of a bit unwieldy, but um, yeah, you sort of end up with uh, this coefficient. And uh, let's look at the quality of this as well and how to predict it. And uh, um, let's actually kind of go through which variable this is a bit confusing now. Uh, so I think it's to be clarified. Um, let me. Thing. So this kind of way of using uh, data sets, I haven't actually worked with it too much, um, the uh, sklearn uh, call. Uh, so you kind of have to reason about it. And I guess one way to find is to just say uh, convert uh, sklearn data set to data frame. Um, and I'm sure there's some function somebody came up with how to do that. Uh, here we go. So that's pretty, pretty simple. Um, So this is the case for the uh, Iris data set, which is went through. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, this is much easier to work with. So let's just look at the um, load um, diabetes data set uh, to pick it up again. And the data set will look something like this. Right, so um, there's a no, it's, I think they're all normalized. So um, uh, essentially normalization means just dividing by um, standard deviation. Normally subtract the mean first and then divide by standard deviation. So all of this are normalized. And uh, there were some six measurements we talked about there and I guess the age, sex, BMI, and blood pressure. Um, what are you trying to predict, I guess, uh, is kind of interesting, actually. So uh, still kind of curious to understand it, but I guess it's some kind of health health metric. Um, just quickly um, look at this. Um, If somebody finds it earlier, you can just post it in the chat as well. Um, good to see some engagement. Yeah, there's a lot of examples, but uh, nobody really talks about uh, what's actually being predicted.
So the few examples are using the data set, and we can look at this. So we can look at the regularized versions of the um, linear regression here. Um, and I'm guessing there should be uh, trying to explain that somewhere. Um, not really. Is there anyone in the chat who knows what's the, uh, uh, I guess, the why there? That would be kind of useful. Anyways, we can go through it during the break um, and to do that now. Uh, but essentially, there's some variable you're trying to predict. And uh, we chose only the first variable to um, predict it with. And so this is a sort of model you come up with um, here. So this object will contain the model. Um, let's sort of try to plot the line for it. And um, let's sort of try to see how it actually fits, whether it fits the data or not. Um, Yes, the plotting is going to be something like this. Um, and we're plotting it on the uh, test set as well, uh, which we haven't created yet. So um, let's create this first. So we need to apply it to the uh, data set. We separate it as a test data set. Um, and you can do that with predict functions. So normally all this like models like function um, objects will have a predict call, which is supply the um, data set you're testing it on, which is X test. And they get the Y predicted here. And it's conveniently highlights that there's no Y predicted here. So now we have it, um, we run this and it will plot the predicted line. Okay, so that's pretty uh, straightforward and it, it kind of has some relationship, but uh, it's not really, um, probably not very useful for much of modeling. And uh, I guess you can sort of get some information on that and uh, get the square error, which is just the, the, the average of the all the deviations and then the, um, the, the variance score, um, what we call here is the um, R-square R score, score, which is sort of the normal way to um, explain or, or kind of benchmark, I guess, uh, most of uh, linear models and uh, that kind of corresponds vaguely to the correlation um, between the uh, parameters, but obviously in the multidimensional sense, it uh, means something else. So in a, in a single univariate case, it's going to be just a uh, correlation. And in multidimensional case, it's sort of a quality of the model and it ranges from um, sort of zero to one. And the more predictive power, the closer to one it will be. Uh, so it's kind of 41%, which is not great, but it's not too bad as well. And it depends sort of on the, um, other models here benchmarking this against. Um, so I um, guess this is kind of a simple univariate example of linear regression. Um, so maybe I'll stop here and uh, ask questions. Uh, if you guys have questions, maybe we can address them now. I'll give it a couple of minutes and maybe we can take a break here as well. Um, it's been almost an hour and a half. So why don't we take a five minute break and uh, people have questions in the meanwhile, I'll be here to answer them. I think someone asked a question. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is sort of the um, cross validation thing we kind of touched before. And um, I guess, you know, you would normally call this hyperparameters. Um, and, you know, most of the non-simple, like non-trivial models will have some 
hyperparameters and you're trying to choose them beforehand. I think the general approach is to try to um, kind of do the uh, k-fold validation on the uh, training data set to first choose the parameter and then apply the model to that. And then you sort of test it on the other data set, uh, on, the, on the validation data set. Um, so I think you kind of end up sort of trying a bunch of values and then you see which one corresponds the best, uh, which sort of again splits the test data sets in like two parts and does it many times. And then you choose the best parameter, which comes up in generally with the best model. Then you apply the whole model on the whole data set, uh, the whole training data set, and then you test the model and testing data set. So that's kind of the general approach. Um, and I'm sure if we look at um, sort of a cross validation example, again, on uh, Scilearn, we'll kind of see that um, um, that's what they end up doing. Um, so I end up doing um, to pick one of the parameters. Uh, so let's see. So matrix players leave one out validation. Uh, so leave one out validation means you just basically create a um, all, all 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 the points except for one, and you test them one, and you do it n times. Um, it's kind of a very simple primitive example of it. Um, I guess let's see if we can actually find some tuning for that. Quite a uh, rich example here, I think. Um, definitely recommend going through it. Um, I think essentially builds up sort of building this uh, pipeline object of the uh, Scalorin, uh, which is sort of a series of steps you use to pre-process data, then to apply the model, and then to um, actually uh, measure that model and compare them uh, across different models. So like, for example, you can pre-process data in different ways, and there are different encoders and normalizations you can apply. Um, and this is sort of like an example. And then you end up building this pipeline where um, you put proposes together with the actual um, um, regression type and transform target regression. I should never used it before. And you specify some parameters. And here, like a uh, regressor um, ends up sort of reach. And reach actually has a specified parameter. You can find like a reach regression with. Uh, uh, maybe a uh, cross validation uh, of the actual um, alpha. Um, and I'm sure this should be an example. Yeah, they actually have a function for that. So, kind of traditional reach, right? And uh, going back to sort of uh, uh, normalization, uh, so regularization, uh, reaches sort of in a flavor on uh, regularization of linear regression, uh, which means you sort of penalize uh, with the L1 um, metric. Um, you know, there's no Wikipedia, I guess, article, but uh, essentially sort of um, going back to that term um, here. So this is L1, this is called reach, the L1 regularization. Um, and specifically to linear regression, but we call it reach, reach regression. Um, and this alpha value, is the parameter you're talking about, which is something you have to choose. So how do you choose this? Is you essentially come up with like a range of alphas. Let's say you can explore 50 alphas and you take the test data set and you run the cross validation of that alpha. And you say, which of this alphas give you the best model within the cross validation framework? Uh, so you keep running it, averaging out and saying, well, actually somewhere in the middle alpha is the best or you know, the alpha in the um, in, in some ranges, the best, and then you come up with an alpha and then train the full model on the full training set and then test it on the testing set. So that's kind of the general approach. And uh, I guess you can build a pipeline um, inside SKLearn, uh, and that's probably a general way to do that. Uh, but actually, for reach itself, they have a cross validated reach version where you specify um, the range of alphas here. So actually, you give it a um, you give it a range, and it will choose the best alpha for you, which is what crystallization normally does. Yeah.
yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, yeah, it would be easy in, uh, with voice, but uh, it's not uh, it's not complex. Um, and again, there's a bit of code finesse to put it together with um, the pipeline. Um, and again, here here you kind of get the uh, uh, the example is pretty simple, and then you can get the selected alpha based on the score, um, and probably the score is for all of them. But essentially, the score is just going to be the uh, uh, quality of the fit, uh, which in that case is uh, probably R squared, uh, or or um, that metric we just looked at before, variance score equals here the example. Yeah, actually, I also have a question that is. Yeah. 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 So, if let's say I'm working on something, a certain data set, how, uh, how do you actually uh, normally decide on which kind of model you want to choose, let's say from the SKLearn library or like perhaps from any other library? Uh, what kind of, I don't know, like the intuition behind like your decision about like which one to try, what kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. I think it makes sense. And I think it's a pretty good, but actually kind of complex question. And I think here, you sort of have to build up experience, right? That's kind of a simple, but not very helpful answer. Um, and I guess you build first the kind of understanding of models. And, you know, let's say there's a linear regression and let's say there is a, something like elastic cross-validated uh, elastic NAT, right? And it's uh, actually combining both regularization with the cross-validation, which is a reasonably um sophisticated version of linear regression which is you know kind of superior in in more ways right so you kind of have a range and maybe you have like 10 models right and let's say we only consider linear models um then you kind of have to uh probably one way is to reason about data and see what's the data looking like and there are a lot of assumptions in linear regression which you have to know about and that's where the sort of the experience comes in and the assumptions can be like uh, it has to be homoscedastic which means that you know the the, the variance of points in different classes, it's kind of the same. Um, it has to have sort of uh, the same kind of uh, temptation has to be efficient as well. There are certain assumptions you do make when you build a linear regression in a mathematical sense. And ideally you would need to know them to actually choose the model, but a more engineering, I guess, and a much more appropriate approach for a hackathon would be just to try everything. And I think it's, uh, it's not really like a bad approach. And again, that helps you develop a lot of intuition so essentially you can kind of uh, uh, go through um, that example I showed before where uh, they have the Ascalaron sort of uh, uh, classification uh, tutorial and they try 10, um, um, 10 classifiers and they compare them, right? And I think you can kind of pretty much use something similar uh, where you build a, um, a code to go through all the classifiers here and try all the models and then rank them based on some metric. Um, so it's a lot of kind of experimentation. It's a lot of fiddling and it's a lot of um, experience. So unfortunately there's no like a generic answer to that, um, but at the same time it makes it exciting because it's kind of solving a puzzle. Um, you look at different features, you look at different uh, potential models and then you keep applying them and then you keep you know, developing understanding and you sort of uh, um, end up with a better result and better. And I guess that's actually, if you look at the competitions in uh, data science, which is sort of uh, normally hosted on Kaggle um, and uh, what people end up sort of doing there, they uh, pretty much uh, throw everything there is to be thrown at the data set and uh, they're uh, trying to get the highest score and compete. And then there's a lot of finesse and how do you combine, how do you adjust, how do you try things. Uh, but once you sort of develop some initial expertise, I think seeing and looking at what other people do with just data is a good way to build some of that intuition. Um, so I think Kaggle would be like a good resource to practice that intuition and to see what other people are doing. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately there's a, a no simple answer to that and kind of you know, the more you try, the better you learn and uh, end up with better intuition. And at the end of the day, it's actually a lot of experiments. Uh, a lot of this sort of uh, modern machine learning, especially deep learning is uh, more of the architecture of the neural network rather than caring too much about the mathematics of it. So I think kind of people try experimenting a lot and Google obviously being, uh, you know, having a lot of uh, resources in computation, they're being very successful there. Um, so 
the computational resource and definitely helps. Ah, I see. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I hope that helps. Again, it's uh, not a simple answer, but um, uh, I have a uh, question about the data uh, for uh, specific trading. Um, I guess there's a few like types of trading, and um, I work in high frequency trading, which means it's a lot of trades a day. Uh, we, we make you know hundreds of thousands of trades a day in various products, um, maybe even millions. And that kind of means that you have a lot of um, data sample, right? You just kind of know if it works or not because you just get really quick feedback. And what happens with this type of trading is that you don't really get any much more than market data because uh, market data is very real time, it's immediate. And uh, your reactions are sort of very immediate as well because you trade so much. Um, so in HFT, there's not much more than actual market data. So you just think about collecting it, structuring it, and extracting more information from market data, even though it seems kind of simple. And there's a lot of sort of um, IP and, and, and uh, alpha in actual market data. Um, so it's kind of hard to do um, HFC without having high quality market data. But then if you start looking at, um, you know, say like me medium frequency or lower frequency trading, uh, which are other sort of um, parts of the quant trading as well. And again, this kind of a scale, like I trading, you know, million times a day, or you're trading like once a month. And this is sort of the range, for example. And some models will be trading very infrequently and they might be using um, you know, economic data. They might be using satellite data. They might be using some scrapes data from um, you know, booking.com or you know, other sort of economic indicators. And there's a lot of alternative data sets, which are, you know, there's a market for that and people are trying to collect them and compete on how to present, collect and make it more real time. Um, it's a pretty sophisticated field already, and I think there's going to be a lot of growth there as well. Um, but I think personally, uh, I don't use it, and uh, being an HFT, you kind of end up with just market data. Hopefully that helps to answer the question. If there is a, um, I'll, I'll leave maybe a couple of more minutes uh, uh, for questions if they coming out and then we'll can resume in maybe a couple of minutes. Oh, yeah, Dennis, just wondering, yeah. maybe question. Yeah, do you actually yeah. work with like machine learning in your day to day job? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Uh, uh, definitely, yes. Um, so, I guess, you know, the kind of a little bit about the industry is that the, uh, uh, I guess you're trying to um, build successful models. And successful model means, I guess, the model which consistently makes money. Uh, you're competing with other people who are doing that. And, uh, um, there's different types of trading you can do. And I guess mostly with high frequency of trading, you end up market making. Uh, so you're kind of trying to build successful market making models. Uh, with, you know, sort of that approach, a large part of model is trying to predict the price um, in some time in the future. Uh, so you end up sort of trying to, um, let's say a simple example, you're going to take the uh, 10 prices before for like every second, and you're going to predict the price a second later. Um, and that's a model. Um, would, wouldn't recommend trading on that, but uh, I'm sure in some markets you probably can make money using that. Uh, there's some very inefficient markets. Uh, but uh, 
uh, yeah, essentially, uh, there's a lot of sort of um, iteration on the quality of the prediction. And the prediction is normally what uh, is called alpha in the, in the industry. So you end up just competing on the quality of prediction a lot. Um, I guess uh, the simple answer is yes, there's quite a lot of work goes into it. Um, but there's also a lot of work goes into, um, you know, being able to deal with that data. And uh, we have, uh, you know, terabytes, uh, maybe hundreds of terabytes of data. And to be able to build regression on 100 terabytes of data is quite hard in terms of uh, running it in like a Python notebook or um, running it in Python period. Um, so you kind of end up coming out with potentially more sophisticated uh, customized solutions for processing this data. Um, and then there's a problem of how do you store this data? How do you access it? There's no single drive which has, um, you know, let's say a petabyte of data. There's going to be distributed. You build up, you know, sort of um, some networking file systems. Um, and then you continue with that. Well, but how do you read it efficiently? And how do you load the memory? And how do you distribute the memory? So there's quite a lot of like um, problems around the data science, which are not necessarily around um, like algorithms or kind of concepts. Um, at some point, you kind of realize the concepts are very kind of straightforward. It's more about to how to use them and how to actually make them work um, and how where to apply them. Uh, so I think a lot of the job is kind of trying to uh, figure out actually where to put the model because uh, it's not normally straightforward. Um, uh, I see. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, hopefully that's helpful. We we'll give it another exactly. maybe thirty seconds. I think someone asked another question. Oh yeah, let me have a look. Uh, how do you know if you're over optimizing your data set? Um, I think there is no apart from using loss functions. So the question is, how do you know if you're over-optimizing your data set apart from using loss functions? Um, so I guess the question is, maybe you can uh, confirm if the question is about um, overfitting. Um, so we're talking about overfitting then, I guess the normal metric is gonna be the quality of prediction out of sample. Um, and normally that's measured with some loss function. Um, you kind of look, talk about some error rates or variance estimators or um, sort of different numerical ways to look at it. Um, are there a non-numerical ways to look at it? Uh, not too sure. Um, normally it's kind of, to even build a model, you kind of have to have a loss function um, because that's what actually guides the math or, or, the, uh, or the machine to uh, move towards the uh, sort of better solution. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think normally you would want to be using uh, loss functions. Uh, so not sure if like, I have to think outside the box here, but uh, I think the answer is you would normally use loss function uh, or some kind of uh, error measurement uh, or the quality of prediction. But again, you kind of have to do it with the whole like train uh, and uh, test data set separation. Uh, so that's kind of a general approach. I hope that uh, helps Sanjay. Maybe you can clarify a question more as well, because uh, it's kind of a, um, like, what do you mean by not using loss function? Because to actually even create an algorithm, you end up coming up first with a loss function because that's what you're actually optimizing, right? Uh, and uh, it's just the general sort of numerical optimization, which is, I guess, the core of any uh, machine learning algorithm. Um, so it's kind of hard to say how, without knowing if you're um, doing right or wrong, how would you know? And I guess in the sense of like unsupervised learning, right? That's kind of a bit more fuzzy because you are you don't know the correct answer, but then you still come up with a way to approximate the correct answer or, or, or try to derive it somehow, right? So in this example of sort of clustering, right? You're like, well, what's the number of clusters? And then once you assign a number of clusters, how do you distribute them? Um, and the algorithm can come up with that, but within a certain solution, there's going to be always um, like a loss function or sort of error rates, right? So I think kind of like thinking about this error rates is uh, quite uh, quite fundamental, I think. 
But do you only understand the question? If I do, uh, do let me know. Okay, uh, then we'll continue. Uh, we have 45 more minutes. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, we kind of looked at this cross-validated bridge section now, which I think illustrates the uh, um, cross-validation pretty, uh, sorry, regularization pretty well. And as someone asks, you kind of have to start using cross-validation to actually be able to afford regularization because otherwise you don't know how much to penalize the model or this term. Um, so you kind of end up writing, again, in SQLR in terms, you're going to be ending up with a pipeline or using a uh, like specific cross-validated um, kind of example. Um, so there's some kind of notes here um, we can kind of go through quickly, uh, but maybe I'll just talk a little bit about it and uh, we can, maybe we can examine the cross-validated uh, case a bit more uh, since there were some questions about it. Uh, but I guess uh, there's sort of three maybe uh, important concepts which kind of steam from regression. And again, it's not like a very structured thing, but uh, if you kind of Google regression, that's what you come up with. And first it's a, you know, so dimensionality reduction or variable selection. Um, and that's an important concept in general because that generally will improve um, the overfitting trade-off, uh, sort of bias variance trade-off. And also it just ends up with a better model and more um, introversible model with fewer variables. Uh, there are many ways to do that. And uh, it's kind of a complex topic and how do you do it is again, kind of a combination of science and art, uh, but it's a big part of that. And um, a lot of like regressions wouldn't kind of do that for you automatically. Uh, like if you think about the um, L1 regularization, and if you try to uh, sort of run uh, or rather maybe differentiate it, right? That's what you end up doing to figure out the uh, uh, moments and how to figure out the um, actual uh, minimum uh, of that loss function. Then you end up potentially with some variables uh, or some coefficients being equal to zero, which means it naturally deselects them. Uh, so one way to variably select is actually to do L1 regularization. Um, and there's quite a few examples in line on that as well. Um, the reach doesn't do it because uh, uh, um, oh, sorry, the reach does do that because it's actually L1. Um, the L2 uh, is uh, the lasso and that doesn't do it. Uh, so you kind of end up with uh, um, different profiles of regularization and you normally you combine them and that's what elastic net is. Um, so you have two parameters there, the weight of the H of the regularizers and then you would want to cross validate that. Uh, so maybe it's a good example to go through. And again, we can just kind of walk through the um, SQL uh, uh, tutorial. Maybe we can go through first um, kind of a simple uh, ridge uh, regression, uh, um, ridge uh, cross validated SQL. Um, it will be an example we already looked a little bit at. Um, but let's go through it quickly. And then um, maybe we can look at the elastic net as well, um, which also will be cross validated. So um, this is exactly ridge regression with a built-in cross-validation. So I want, you can alternatively build a pipeline within the uh, SQLearn. Um, I won't be going through that here, uh, but there's again, quite a few tutorials on that. Um, the example here is using the diabetes um, data set again. Um, essentially, why don't we just run this code and then we can see how it changes with, for example, different range of alphas you can give it to. And let's see if there are more examples with it and if there's anything interesting. Um, yeah, there's an interesting thing about the transformation, like um, we can look at the variable transformation as well, uh, which I guess kind of goes to the data preprocessing. Um, and uh, it's often a very, very, like, if you look at a Kaggle competitions, for example, that's like a very large step of how people work with the data before actually going to it. And again, for us, it's a big part as well of where you try to combine data or combine features in certain ways or, or actually design features. Um, so um, that's kind of an interesting step, but let's just run this code quickly and I explain how it works and then we'll go into 
the next one. It's quite a bit of information in that uh, sort of uh, model object. Uh, so let's uh, take it. Uh, I think we can be able to copy it. So first, we need to import uh, the relevant libraries and the data set. Uh, we already have that, but we can reimport it again. It wouldn't complain. Um, uh, this essentially probably just structures the output of it um, into two um, variables rather than actually going through it ourselves like we did before. Uh, there's different ways to dissecting that, uh, but ends up with the same. And this kind of gives you a cross-validated model of Ridge. Uh, so kind of run this um, and it will output you the score. Um, and this is the um, R squared. Uh, it wouldn't, it's R squared of the model, which is you can see in the uh, comment as well. Um, so the higher the R squared, the better. Um, you can also see in the model uh, the actual chosen parameter of the of, of the uh, alpha. So that would be alpha. Uh, so the cross validation has been run and it ends up being um, the 1%, which is uh, this value here. Um, so this seems to be the best kind of point. And uh, you can run it again for each of them separately and kind of see what score it gives you. And maybe we can go through that quickly. Um, um, so if you do this, you kind of see how um, the R squared is sort of uh, best here. Um, and it could be a bit misleading um, because the R squared is uh, kind of on that uh, particular um, alpha, uh, so the highest one is actually here. Um, and the R squared for it is kind of the best, but it doesn't mean that the alpha is the best because it doesn't actually choose it here uh, because this is already a score of the model, um, which again, doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. Um, and that's kind of hard to think about this cross validation thing because uh, first you have to, um, look at all these alphas within the cross-validation, which you don't see in the score here. Uh, you don't have access to the object. Um, and then it chooses the best, and then it looks at the score of the whole model. So in this case, even though the 1% um, uh, value was chosen in this model, and you end up with this score, there's actually a model which could be better on that single metric, which ends up here. Um, so which is kind of a, you know, it's not that different. So then it just kind of, you end up in this numerical uh, optimization problem where the values are very close and now you think, well, does it actually matter? But in general, that's mathematically the right approach. Um, and you want to give it like a fair range of values and let it go through it. But again, um, just by virtue of noise, it might choose something not super optimal, or even if you measure it here, you might not, it might not look like it wasn't optimal, but it is optimal. So uh, I guess, uh, yeah, this is sort of what it ends up doing. And if you print the alpha, it ends up being not like the highest score for the total model. And obviously I removed it from here, it will choose something else. Oh, actually I didn't remove that one from here, yeah, this one. Right, so now like the uh, 1000 is the best value and this actually gives you the highest score. But again, in the more sort of global sense, that's a uh, better approach is to give a range of values and allow it to choose for you. Uh, and I'm sure you can control the uh, cross validation faults here. Um, there's a CVE parameter on the right side, which is none by default. And I think it's just a tuple of uh, the fold and the size of the fold, the number of folds and the size of the fold. Um, to cross validate it. And there's different, again, cross validation modes here, uh, which is, you know, like leave one out or uh, uh, random fold, or um, there's quite a few of them, so you can choose that. Um, so that's kind of a simple example of that. Maybe we can look at the um, cross validation uh, with transformation, uh, the one we just talked before. Uh, and it's an interesting thing to look at the variable transformation too, um, which you don't, I wasn't really planning to cover, but. Um, since it came up, we can look at it as well. Um, so let's look what's going here. So we're looking at the um, make regression data set. So maybe just a 
um, some kind of random data set. And let's continue. So let's do variable transformation. Let's do all the imports first. Um, then let's see, we get, uh, so essentially, yeah, it ends up, so there is some problem. Uh, why do we care about it? Maybe a versioning problem, actually. We don't really need this. Um, so this basically creates a regression, and you can choose parameters for it. Um, I think it just creates a univariate uh, data series with x and y. It chooses a number of samples. I think it chooses the noise, which I'm guessing is just a standard deviation. Um, some kind of renormalized, you kind of have to look at what it actually means. And this probably this is a seed. So the seed is something which you can fix and it will kind of give you the same data set all the time. If you don't give it a seed, it actually will be truly random. So a seed is like a good technique to get something um, random, but consistently the same. Um, so if they actually pose this code, like I'll get the same code in my machine too, because it has the same seed, the same originating uh, sort of sequence. Um, so here, um, I guess you end up with some exponential function, so we're transforming uh, y uh, to a different um, uh, sort of scale, and it's going on exponential scale, and uh, now you sort of retransform it back. So I think there's some charting thing they do, and the distribution changes because it kind of goes from the normal um, um, to, or rather, goes from exponential to normal distribution. And in in regression sense, you always want to have your variables normally distributed. So kind of the general strategy is to try to adjust them so that every variable is normally distributed. Again, it's not something which is quick to explain and it's not basic, but that's what I think they're trying to do here. And uh, if you look at this code, I'll go through this code as well. Um, it just ends up plotting these two, um, two distributions. Uh, why is it complaining? Uh, yeah, there were some things I didn't post first. I'll just do density true. I think they, they kind of made some um, if, if else case on the version. And I think depending on the Ascular version, uh, you might end up specifying different name. So I guess this tutorial was written at some point and they haven't updated it after it got deprecated. Uh, but shouldn't be too important for us. We just add this here. If it doesn't work, we can use the other one. Right. So yeah, this is kind of the original um, distribution of y. And there's quite a few mathematical problems if you end up fitting into something like that. Uh, so you don't want to be doing that. And uh, the idea here is that you try to put it on a different scale. So I guess they're uh, applying um, a um, sort of logger transformation to it um, with some uh, shift as well. And ends up from here to that distribution, which is obviously a lot more normal. Um, probably still not normal, but does look a bit more uh, normal. So um, that's kind of the general sense you want to try and achieve, but again, might not work all the time. And then I guess uh, the example here goes through how would reach work if it's not normalized uh, or rather transformed versus the untransformed case. Um, so let's go through, actually let me go through this code first and it's a bunch of plotting things, but it's still kind of valuable. Um, so in the pyplot library or matplot library, you can create the subplots and that will just imply that you have two um, sort of subplots or subfigures here um, and allow you to plot on them separately. So here that AX1, X0 uh, would be the first histogram and AX1 would be the second histogram for transform variable. Um, basically to get the histogram, you just call the histogram and call on the target, which is Y. Um, and the number of bins is just a number of um, the uh, buckets, I guess, here. Uh, so you sort of uh, look at that and that gives you like a pretty, um, you know, fine version of it. And if you obviously decrease it, it look kind of rougher because if you down to it, will go down. Um, there's some kind of plotting niceness. You don't have to use it. Um, so I guess this is limited because I think the values go so high that it becomes hard to actually see much, but let's remove the limit and I think actually we'll see 10 
buckets of the values now. Yeah, so you can see the, the, the frequency is so low that it's almost impossible to see it. And that's the general problem of uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, some forms of data where um, it's so uh, exponential, for example, like this is like so rare to see and it's so high value, that you might as well just bring them closer. And that's what this would do. It would just bring them closer and shift it as well. Um, and again, this is sort of the formula where um, you are, um, I mean, first we created like a problematic case, which is not transformed, which is exponentially moved it to the expansion scale and shifted as well. And this is just bringing it back to the linear, which is just logarithm and exponent. So um, this is how the normal case kind of looks like. Uh, and then the example kind of goes through uh, just feeding two regressions of different targets, uh, one which was transformed and one wasn't transformed. And uh, this is the uh, code. Let's go through this. So again, um, just some plotting stuff. Uh, you're initializing the regressor class, uh, which is the reach cross validated. Um, and you can fit the um, train and uh, tra train data set here, which we initialized again. There's a function to train test split, which will allow you to randomly split the data sets into two. And to remind you, the data set is just kind of a randomly generated. I think it's probably just normal distribution against each other, but with some linear relationship between X and Y and some noise, right? Just to test linear regression. Um, so you end up with two uh, data set, the test and the train data set, um, and that the function to do the split in a kind of basic case. The random state is just to make sure that it's all the same every time you run it, because otherwise it will be truly random. Um, and here, Again, yeah, you kind of first deal with some plotting and you're plotting the actual values and the uh, prediction line. Um, and here again, the just the kind of linear on that original um, data frame, uh, sorry, the, the data set. Uh, but since the data set got conver kind of converted or transformed here uh, or corrupted by uh, a nonlinear function, the regression doesn't really make sense here because uh, essentially it ends up kind of looking like a um, straight line into logarithm. Uh, and what ends up being here is they actually convert the um, uh, target into a logarithm. And that makes a lot more sense now. Um, so this kind of crazy values here, they don't show up so much. Um, and I guess that's what kind of you want to try to do. Again, we first corrupted it, and then we put it onto normal scale, not log scale. And the exponential scale, obviously, it's not going to work so well. And uh, I guess you can see that the quality of the fit is a lot lower. You get R squared of 41%. In that case, you have 66%. And the uh, mean average error um, is a lot higher. So um, kind of end up uh, a lot better result with obviously doing that. Um, and in all of this example, um, we can go through less plotting parts of it. Uh, uh, so here you just do the rich fit of the not transform sets and you predict. And then uh, you're doing the transform case. Um, so the interesting thing about the transform case, you sort of fit it there, but then you have to do the inverse function uh, to the actual uh, regression equation, right? To kind of come back to it. So that's where you specify it here uh, to make sure that you bring it back uh, to the same scale. Um, and then you fit and you do the same predict prediction again. So essentially this is just a wrapper on the ridge, but allowing for that transformation step we did before to transform it to something more reasonable. Um, and there's various ways to figure out how to transform which functions to use. And again, it's not within the scope of the uh, workshop. So uh, you can look a lot on you know, variable transformation and it's a big part too, but um, this is kind of a basic example where we intentionally transformed into something harder to deal with and then compare the two cases. Um, and maybe I'll stop here and ask if there are questions. I guess I just give a minute to ask questions. Normally they come out a little bit later.
I'll try to find the example with the cross validation pipeline um, for SKLearn. So you don't have to necessarily use the um, sort of predefined class of like Ridge. You can use normal Ridge, but then just pipe it into the um, uh, into the um, pipeline. So here, let's just refresh and search. Search is here. All right. So for example, here, um, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through guys here. Um, you can doing the principal component analysis, and that's something which just shrinks your data set, meaning that you have, let's say, 100 um, variables. It tries to explain them within your combinations of these 100 variables, but in less than 100 variables, right? Uh, so you sort of transform it linearly, and you end up with the, uh, in a kind of mathematical sense, it would be with the basis of that sort of matrix operator. Um, and uh, by doing that, you kind of end up building the eigenvectors. So there's a few parameters like it tries to kind of target, and you can sort of numerically force it to be a certain number of components uh, in, in this PCA. And uh, I think there's a log space, different, I guess, uh, constant uh, for the logistic regression to move to log space, which you can also optimize on. Um, so you end up basically creating the um, logistic regression object and the PCA object. Then you pull them together in a pipeline like that. Um, that allows you to basically run the model through both of them at the same time, while first going through the PCA and then logistic. Um, and then there are some parameters involved in this uh, process. And the parameters are here. And what you end up doing, you're doing a grid search, which means you're gonna go through some number of uh, um, values of this and it will try to find the best cross-validated value for these two uh, parameters within this uh, grid. And the grid is three by five. So there's 15 potential outcomes. And this is basically a parameter for correlation. Um, and that just does everything for you. So um, just going back to the question before, when people asked about, uh, well, if there, are, if there are parameters, how do you deal with this? This is how you deal with them. Um, one way is to do this grid search. You can obviously actually allow them for um, be more continuous and use, let's say, a, a stochastic gradient descent or some kind of um, algorithm, which is just used for optimization. And you can also do the ANSCALR. Um, but in a basic case, it's a great search. And it just finds the best point out of this. Um, and here again, it's kind of complex because you're doing first PCA and then pulling this regression. But um, I guess the general sense of uh, cross-validation, you can just kind of put it through like this. And I think they might have actually logistic regression cross validated, which you sort of do um, with stuff that you have to do. So I guess that's kind of your own choice whether you're putting a pipeline of objects together or you're using kind of a pre pad single call here. And there, the choice was to do cross validation together rather than have two objects which are separately cross validated. Um, again, this is kind of going towards the deep learning sort of engineering type considerations uh, where it's kind of hard to reason which one is going to be better and there's maybe some theory but it's best for us to try both and uh, explore and see what model actually ends up being more predictive so there were no more questions then uh, we have 20 minutes so i guess i'll probably try to go through some stuff quickly um and more conceptually and maybe we'll go through uh uh, some one more example, uh, and then I'll leave maybe ten minutes at the end for uh, for questions. If there are any questions about um, anything in the in the workshop, and uh, I'll share the uh, the deck. Uh, you all have access to the uh, Python notebook. Um, I can send you my personal one, which is probably a lot cleaner than this one because you're just kind of doing stuff together. Uh, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to the organizer after, and they might forward it to you later. Um, so let's talk a little bit about classification. And uh, that's another problem of um, supervised learning. Uh, and it means, again, that you know what the output is, and the output is y. And you're trying to figure out or predict y based on x. And x is just the feature set. 
Um, and that's what we're trying to do in the beginning. We're um, looking at this uh, sort of um, iris uh, data set. Maybe actually we'll finish with that as well. Uh, we'll just try to build some class classification sort of algorithm for it. Um, this is the example I talked about before and I already showed it where basically we can go through all the classifiers or quite, quite a few of them inside the sklearn uh, and just compare them one to each other and see what actually ends up being classified. And they have different, uh, I'll try to zoom in here. It's uh, not very easy to read, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's better. So this is kind of the original input data and uh, you can kind of see how um, it actually will uh, classify it based on um, the, the scores and the values. So um, depending on what they're doing and what the property of it, uh, it ends up quite, quite a different result. And you can kind of see, for example, the interesting shapes of it, like decision trees are, there's a lot more sort of, oh, it's if else, you know, if the value is here and the other values, you know, in that region, then you apply that and this ends kind of like a rectangular structure, uh, which is kind of uh, the result of that if else type thing. You can just cut out the part here. And then the branching factor and the size of the tree is probably determined by a um, hyperparameter, which you can cross validate as well. A random forest is essentially a bunch of trees together. So it has kind of similar uh, structure as well, but um, a lot more complex. And you can see there's a lot of this very um, kind of small, but still if else conditions. Um, I guess, yeah, you can kind of see Gaussian stuff and neural nets, it's kind of very smooth and uh, kind of, um, I guess it would be a Gaussian function. Uh, so it's kind of exponential to a point. Um, and more continuous. And in other interesting case, I guess, is the SVM, which is a support vector machine. Uh, it's it's very linear. Um, so you end up with obviously straight lines and you can choose how you want to separate them. Um, but it only does linear separation. Uh, you can you can read more about it, um, but um, you have to choose kind of the uh, basically split between them and end up with some potentially not very optimal result. And the more complex, so sort of data set, uh, again, here it's not linear at all because you can see that it's kind of hard to separate it and this is even less linear and this is probably more linear. So here like the linear SVM performs quite well. So you can just split them by a straight line um, and the decision tree does pretty well. Uh, the decision tree is pretty actually powerful uh, even though it's kind of simple, um, but it's normally kind of prone to overfitting as well. Uh, and you can read a lot about these algorithms and I think it's quite fascinating actually. And the coolest thing is just try it quickly um, but um, that sort of describes the classification problem and uh, there's quite a variety of algorithms uh, available. Um, and I guess the simplest one is the nearest uh, neighbors um, where you're just gonna say within certain, um, I guess you just say like, you're only gonna choose three closest neighbors in this example here. And if they happen to be of a certain class, let's say it's blue, then you classify that one, that point as blue. Um, and then you kind of apply that iteratively to all the points and you might have to iteratively reapply that and there's gonna be some convergence to that. Um, or, or you, you know, it's a numerical thing. So you either specify a convergence criterion or you just say the max iterations. So will just iterate to that. Uh, and it's pretty efficient. You can see again on the, uh, on the example here, it does pretty well, um, kind of algorithm. So, uh, it's not too, it's not too bad. Um, I guess the other sort of approach um, is a more unsupervised learning. And this is kind of a, I guess, short outline of that. And essentially you're trying to um, find the clusters without knowing the clusters. Um, and you actually don't know what is what. And here um, the k-means essentially just looks for the um, kind of average uh, distance to um, the, the class members. And it kind of ends up being linearly separated. Um, I guess the mini batch version is gonna be some more sort of cluster optimized and it's more of a numerical thing, I guess. So it ends up being pretty much the same. This is just the difference highlight of it. Um, and again, it's unsupervised learning. So there's no, if you just look at that original picture, there's no classes. It's kind of hard to be right or wrong here. Um, you don't know that. Uh, and 
you allow the machine to work out what's, you know, kind of looks close in data and define these classes. Um, and that's kind of quite commonly used to test classification. So unless you explicitly spe specify all the text classes, um, you normally just allow the machine to figure out what are the, all the classes and how to uh, figure them out. Um, again, we won't go through that. We don't have enough time, but uh, it's kind of the general concept. Um, I had a few slides on deep learning um, and neural nets, and maybe it's a bit excessive at this point, um, but I'll just kind of talk about it maybe for five minutes, uh, and then I'll leave 10 minutes of time at the end. Uh, and deep learning is something which became quite popular maybe uh, 10, 10 years ago. And it wasn't very, um, you know, it kind of originated maybe in 70s or 60s. Uh, and probably the math behind it was originated even earlier. And it's not the most, I guess, easy to understand approach um, because it's hard to interpret it. Um, but it's probably the most powerful now. Um, and I think the development of it and the rise of it is attributed to mostly the computational power. So now that we have more powerful computers, it's a lot easier to um, kind of come up with successful um, sort of neural networks uh, and be able to understand it. And I guess that's what deep means. You kind of try to find some deep relationships in data, which is very hard to reason about. And the way people kind of design this is based on the actual uh, human brain, where you have a bunch of neurons connecting to each other and communicating with it, and they can activate. They have a bunch of inputs and outputs. Um, and depending on the inputs to a particular one, it has an output of one zero that connects to the next layer. Uh, and the actual network of connections is what the algorithm is going to find. And the weights of um, kind of taking the inputs from the previous layer is also a um, optimized parameter. So it's kind of a hard thing to even look at and reason about. And there's a few examples in line, um, you can play around with different structures. Um, actually, maybe we can find one that is more, I remember, clustering with uh, neural uh, networks, uh, maybe dynamic interactive. And uh, this is an example where you can choose uh, different, uh, no, I don't think I can find it, but uh, you can essentially choose different parameters and see how it affected and it will kind of train it dynamically in your browser. Um, I'll, I'll add it to the presentation, I just remembered it now. But it's kind of interesting to see how the effects of like having different layers and the size of layers actually implies in any certain classification problems. Uh, and there's a lot of engineering here uh, because it's quite numerically complex. Uh, there's a lot of hardware involved. Uh, and generally, um, again, it's kind of easy to use because you can just write like a few lines of uh, TensorFlow um, and it can solve a lot of things like image recognition. But at the same time, it's sort of, uh, a bit hard to um, reason, you can't really interpret it. Uh, you know, if you're trying to like predict the say GDP by employment rate, which is kind of a common relationship in economics, if you build a neural network in that, uh, it's gonna be hard to say, well, if one goes up, then one goes down, what happens? You kind of look at this curve, it gives you some curve, but the curve can be very complex. Well, the linear regression can say, well, for every percent of GDP, you get, you know, an extra decrease of half percent in employment. And that's easy to understand. Um, so again, I think it's very powerful, but hard to interpret. And it's probably the most advanced in terms of the applications. Um, like a lot of sort of Google advancements recently, uh, quite quite phenomenal, I think. And you can look at the, uh, you know, the games they're solving and how they apply this and these different architectures and different ways to build them, optimize, uh, kind of choose how parameters and how to reason about them. So um, it's quite interesting, but um, I guess I'll stop at this at this point. I'm not going to go through TensorFlow. Um, I think they have a pretty good uh, setup on their website. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll leave it here and I'll just leave 10 minutes for questions if you have any questions left. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dennis, for yeah for bringing thanks, the Steven. workshop. Yeah. Yeah, for anyone, if you have any questions, feel free to type it in the chat box. Yeah. Or maybe I just probably I can, I, I want to ask like one question. How yes. do you think is like the, I don't know, like the trade off between like the complexity of implementing like deep learning versus like the 
I don't know, versus like the available models in like a scalar versus like the result maybe. <laughs> Have you ever come? Yeah, um, actually the deep learnings are not so hard to implement. Um, I guess if you think about, about it, uh, and I don't think SKLR actually has them. Uh, I think uh, there might be some versions of it, but people kind of tend to use TensorFlow. It's easier to scale and uh, it's kind of a lot more common. Uh, so SKLR is used for other types of models, but I think they probably have some neural networks for classifiers and things like that, but it's not used extensively. And then um, the complexity of putting one together, it's probably equivalent. Uh, because I guess in Python, again, going through all of these examples earlier, you can see it's probably, you know, five, 10 lines of code. It's pretty, you know, could be, could be quite simple. Um, and it doesn't get harder for uh, deep learning. Uh, the problem with deep learning, it's uh, harder to reason about it because you don't get like a single sort of coefficient output and single relationship or kind of a simple um, kind of visualization of that. And, uh, I think it's harder because of that to use it. Um, so it's kind of in in like in, in finance, for example, it's uh, you know people are starting to use it, but only starting to use it. And I think in image recognition, they've been using it for uh, definitely more than five, uh, probably more than ten years already. Um, and again, it's been developed in, in the 60s or 70s, so it's a pretty old framework. But because of more computational power, uh, it's easier just to leave things to be optimized out and kind of abstract away from actual modeling, which is what it's doing here. Um, so I think from the point of view of user, it's probably the same, but from the point of view of like end goal, I think it's much harder to get um, sort of deep learning to work well in a specific problem, um, especially if your problem is not very trivial. Uh, so it's kind of a, you kind of get that as well. And like, if you look at Kaggle as well, I think Often what people end up doing is just like this ensembles of models and uh, you kind of end up building 10 models and then they'll come up with a way to combine that. And there will be some probably neural networks, but actually a lot of um, sort of random forest and uh, linear regression stuff still. So uh, with a lot of transformation and kind of feature pre-selection and quite a few other improvements, but um, you know, th this is kind of a framework you kind of try to use in a very abstract, hard to understand like game theory way, for example. Uh, but I think a lot of problems can be dealt with without using it. Ah, I see. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, anyone have any question for those who are still here or Maybe I'll say a few words about the company then. Uh, uh, since uh, there's no questions, and uh, mm -hmm. I guess you know if you, if if you guys are interested in uh, machine learning and obviously uh, it's part of Hackathon, um, the work we do is very close to that uh, because basically it's a lot of reverse engineering. It's a lot of um, data analysis and figuring out how to use data for real time decisions. Um, so it's very very exciting. Um, it's definitely not a straightforward sort of um, B2C type product building. Um, it's a lot of very customized tech and uh, it's quite interesting and challenging in terms of the actual problem uh, because everybody's trying to compete and uh, it's quite efficient, uh, but you can always figure out ways to do better. And I think because of the market and dynamic people or, or the environment will naturally push you to be better. Um, so you always kind of uh, end up learning a lot more uh, compared to, um, say, you know, working in like a large tech company where you could be working a very, very large product, but since there's no other competition, you know, the actual improvement doesn't really matter or it matters to a certain points, but, you know, let's say if you're building a very efficient, uh, e-wallet or some other product, uh, so far as it works, let's say under 50 milliseconds, you don't really care because there's no other wallet. If there is one, it works for 40 milliseconds. It doesn't really matter. Um, or if it, you know, ends up being more um, useful. So it's a little more business there, but actually for the contrary, you end up with a lot more uh, reverse engineering and problem solving and um, 
quite very, very exciting problems. So um, if people are interested in that, I uh, definitely recommend uh, checking our website. And uh, if they're looking for full time, we're hiring and we're hiring for um, internship as well. So. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Thanks, uh, yeah, maybe if there's no more question, I would like to maybe just yeah, do you mind if I share like one last slide? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, maybe for uh those of you who are still here, I will also send this to all of uh of everyone who have registered for the workshop and also uh send the link to the recording for this workshop. Yeah, so would be happy if you can uh give feedback for this workshop. Uh, and also like do recommend us on like what kind of topics we can bring to the workshop for both hack and roll next year or maybe Friday our Friday hacks or hacker school event. Yeah, we run a lot of uh, workshops, event, uh, meetups. Uh, but uh, every uh, for like Friday hacks and hacker school is weekly for hack and roll. Yeah, it's definitely uh, once a year. Yeah, so yeah, do give us some feedback and yeah, uh, if that's all, maybe we are reaching uh, to the end of this workshop. Maybe if Dennis and or Chelsea want to give like some additional. Yeah, there's, um, there's one question in the chat is how to apply for, um, I guess a job with Alpha Lab. Um, and uh, the, you can go to the website and there's a careers um, uh, page there. So uh, you can contact us and we'll get back to you. So definitely excited about uh, people who are interested in solving good problems. Yeah, you can visit the link shared by Dennis in the chat. Yep. Yeah. That's good. Thanks. Yeah. If there's no more questions or no more words, then yeah, I guess uh that's all for this workshop for today. Yeah. Thanks all for uh, everyone for coming. Yeah. And yeah, uh, for those of you who haven't scanned like the QR code or like want to just like go through the link to give us some feedback, yeah, just uh feel free to just scan it or like click the uh open the link. And then, yeah, that's all for the uh, today's workshop. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And yeah, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the day. And yeah, we still have uh, two more workshops. Tomorrow we will have the intro to web dev workshop. And uh, two days from now, we'll have like the intro to Telegram bots. So yeah, do come if you want to figure out about them. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks everyone. And I guess I'll just end the meeting soon. Yep.